any health-related information on the following show provides general information only. Content presented on any show by any host or guest should not be substituted for a doctor's advice. Always consult your physician before beginning any new diet, exercise, or treatment program. Welcome to Accelerated Health TV and Radio Show. I'm your host, Sarah Banta. I'm a health coach, natural supplement expert, and a busy mom of three. Make sure you hit the subscribe button below so you're notified every week with my new podcast on Mondays and Tuesdays. And if you haven't already, join my free group coaching on Telegram with the link below. I teach you on a daily basis with tips and tools to enhance your health, and there's no downside. You will be a part of a like-minded group to support you on your journey in addition to truly taking control of your health. Isn't that the goal? My goal is to reach everyone on earth with eyes to see and ears to hear my message of healing. So help me with that goal. Share this podcast with a few of your friends who may need my help. And it's working. We are reaching over 600,000 people a month and all across the globe in Dubai and in South America, in Europe, everywhere it, the word is being spread. And I am super excited to have our guest on today, um, a topic that is so dear to my heart and my coaching is surrounding this topic, Dr. Robert Lustig, professor of pediatrics in the Division of Endocrinology and member of the Institute for Health Policy Studies at UCSF. He's a a neuroendocrinologist with expertise in metabolism, obesity, and nutrition. He's one of the leaders in the current anti-sugar movement that is changing the food industry, and he has dedicated his retirement from clinical medicine to help fix the food supply. Please help God. We need this. So thank you for being here, Robert. I just love your work and super excited to get into this discussion about the toxic truth of processed foods. Well, thanks very much for having me, Sarah. As you said, this is a very big topic and we only have 50 minutes. So let's let's get to it. Let's get to it. We might have to have a part B, but um, this is a topic, as I mentioned before we came on, I'm so passionate about mom of three. My kids are now old enough where they're making their own food decisions but I've taught them well enough to know how their body reacts when they don't eat right. And they go, oh, I should actually do what my mom told me. But raising them in the last um, 15 years in this environment where 67% of what children are eating is processed foods, and that's not real food. But here my kids are coming to school with Uh, organic vegetables and some protein without the processed white bread and their friends are having the goldfish with the juice box and they feel weird and I'm trying to teach them that it's okay to be not normal you're gonna thank me later on but when you try to tell these kids that it's very difficult and so it's it's we're in a, a world where it, it really are we are salmon swimming upstream and then that's on top of all of the other toxicity that we're being bombarded with and that's my specialty in helping people detox in this toxic world but processed mm-hmm. foods is a big part of that uh, but- well it's particularly problematic because half the people think that processed food is food You know, if you think Cheetos is food, you know, it's all over. It's just that simple. So that actually leads us to the question of is ultra processed food food? Now, in order to answer that question, you actually have to know the definition of food. And if you go to the dictionary, and I love this definition because it's exactly 100% right. This is the definition. Quote, any substrate that contributes to either growth or burning of an organism. So growth or burning. Let's do burning first. Does ultra processed food contribute to burning? Now people would say, well, you know, sugar is four calories per gram. You know, if you blow it up in a bond calorimeter, it releases energy. Therefore, sugar has energy. Therefore, it contributes to energy, right? 
to contributes to burning. Uh, that actually turns out not to be true. Now, if you blow up sugar in a bomb calorimeter, yes, you get four calories per gram, but we are not bomb calorimeters. We generate our energy through these little organelles inside our cells called mitochondria. You've probably heard of those from 10th grade and your audience has too. You know, it's kind of part and parcel of, you know, biology 101. Okay, these subcellular organelles turn nutrient into a uh, compound called ATP. ATP, adenosine triphosphate. The energy is located in the phosphate bonds. So generating ATP is what it's all about. And then the cell uses that ATP to power whatever it needs to. <clears throat> Turns out that sugar, specifically the molecule fructose, the sweet molecule in sugar, the molecule we seek, the molecule that turns out to be addictive, turns out to inhibit three separate enzymes necessary for normal ATP generation. It inhibits the enzyme AMP kinase, which is the fuel gauge on the liver cell, telling the liver to make more energy. It inhibits the enzyme ACADL, acyl-CoA dehydrogenase long chain, which is necessary to cleave um, uh, fatty acids into two carbon fragments so that they can be burned. It uh, inhibits CPT1, carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1. Do not worry, I will not test you on this. Mm -hmm. But the point is that that is one of the uh, ways to get the uh, fatty acids from the outside of the mitochondria to the inside of the mitochondria so they can be burned. Bottom line, sugar turns out to inhibit burning. So it fails on that score. So let's go to the next one. Growth. Does ultra-processed food contribute to growth? My colleague, Dr. Efrat Monsenigo Ornan, who is the head of nutrition at Hebrew University, Jerusalem, looked at this question directly. It turns out that ultra-processed food actually inhibits growth. It inhibits cortical bone growth. It inhibits trabecular bone growth. It inhibits cancellous bone growth. It inhibits weight gain. It actually inhibits growth. Or it can contribute to cancer growth. So it hijacks growth rather than normal growth. <clears throat> so if a substrate does not contribute to growth and does not contribute to burning, is it a food? Well, turns out ultra processed food is not food. Well, if it's not food, what is it? It's poison because it's inhibiting normal processes that should be going on. And this is why we are seeing pretty much the epidemic, the pandemic, if you will, of chronic metabolic disease spreading across the globe in every country that has adopted the Western diet. And we've actually shown that sugar is a primary driver of diabetes, of heart disease, of fatty liver disease, and of tooth decay. And we have correlational evidence for uh, sugar and cancer and sugar and dementia as well. So, ultra-processed food, not food. What's so interesting is as a mom, you know, I've, all three of my kids are athletes and they'll grab snacks to go and then to go work out and they'll want to grab some of these processed foods. And I'll say, you're wanting energy, but did you know those foods are actually stealing energy from your body? It's such an interesting concept where... Um, you think you're eating food to give you energy to increase ATP, which happens with real food, but this processed food, which is not real food, is actually stealing energy from you and causing the, me the metabolic diseases. Well, this brings us to what happened in, in 1980, because I look at my parents' generation Yep. They are both thin people. They've never had a weight issue. They've never even thought about what they're putting in their mouth. They eat tons of sugar. Well, yeah. that was fine before 1980 because it was real sugar and it was not processed. No, that's not true. The sugar is sugar, whether it's processed sugar or real sugar. The difference was the amount. So it's not that sugar was ever any good. It's just that, you know, the dose determines the poison. So back in 1980, our mean consumption was 51 grams a day. Now that's still high, 
But by the end of 1990, our consumption was not 51, it was 104. We doubled our sugar consumption in one decade. Mm. Now, the question is, how and why? Well, number one, uh, we were told to go low fat. And, you know, the flavor was in the fat and low fat food tastes like cardboard. So what did they do? They added sugar to make it palatable. Number two, the um, uh, dietary guidelines said eat less fat, right? Mm -hmm. So that, you know, compounded the problem. And then we had high fructose corn syrup, which turned out to be half the price of cane sugar and that basically substituted and then we had hurricane allen which destroyed the entire caribbean sugar crop and made us rely on uh, high fructose corn syrup even more and then what happened was the food industry realized hey when we add high fructose corn syrup to food people buy more and the more they added the more we bought because it's addictive and so the combination of all of these basically created this tsunami whereby we now consume over quadruple our liver, liver's limit in terms of total sugar uh, 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 threshold. Uh, in the same way, we have a threshold for alcohol consumption. And if we go over it, we get sick and we also get drunk. Okay. We don't get drunk but we certainly get sick and we get sick at about the same level, about 25 grams, about 25 grams of alcohol puts you over the edge, about 25 grams of sugar puts you over the edge, but we're at 94. Okay. So this is the problem. Now it turns out that some of the uh, processed food companies have actually recognized this problem and have reduced their sugar footprint. For instance, Unilever and Danone have both reduced their total burden of sugar by a total of 14 percent so if you go from 120 grams down 14 percent you're now down to about 104 grams right mm -hmm. question is if 25 is your limit does going from 120 to 104 make a difference no. not really so that's where we are and that's what the problem is so we haven't really seen any beneficial effect the question is, can you still have ultra processed food that's healthy? And the answer is actually, yes, you can. We're not doing it. There's no company in America that is currently engaging in such a practice. But we actually worked with a Middle Eastern food company, kind of the Nestle of the Middle East called Kuwaiti Danish Dairy Company, KDD. And I talk about it in my book, Metabolical. What we did was we partnered with them and we went through their entire portfolio to figure out what was good, what was bad, what they could change, what they couldn't, what they had to get rid of, what they could promote. We re-engineered their entire portfolio. We re-engineered their entire recipe list to become metabolically healthy. Now, the question you ask, of course, is, well, how do you do that? <laughs> you know, not, not by snapping your fingers. You got to actually know what you're doing. Turned out there were three precepts that we had to follow. If we followed these three precepts, we could make ultra processed food healthy. And those three precepts are protect the liver, feed the gut, support the brain. Mm -hmm. Any food that does all three of those is by definition healthy. Any food that does none of those three, by definition, is poison. Any food that does one or two, but not all three, is going to be somewhere in the middle. And so the question is, can we take foods that are zero for three and turn them into one for three or two for three, or even for that matter, three for three? And the answer is, yes, you can. You have to know what you're doing. And so we've done it, and we know what the rules are, we know what the principles are, and we published this in Frontiers in Nutrition uh, in March of 2023. And companies are starting to take notice. It's actually the most cited paper in all of Frontiers in Nutrition this year. 
and we've had several companies now come to our team to figure out how they can do this for their own company. So the you know the, the things are starting to move and I'm very proud of that. Because of you. And so that's why we need to get your message out. Well, with the processed foods, there's so many things I want to tackle here. So bear with me. You you mentioned liver and you mentioned the gut. So yeah. what I'd like to go through is number one, what is it about processed foods that's killing the killing the gut and destroying the liver? And mm -hmm what actually helps heal the gut and what helps with the liver. And right. both of those things are also being attacked by radiation, toxicity, fluoride, bromide, chlorine, all of these other things. And then the processed foods is like the, the tsunami that is coming after it. So Indeed. The, yeah, that is all true. Um, so let, let's start with um, feed the gut. That's actually a good place to start. Feed the gut. All right. Why do you have to feed the gut? And what's in the gut that you have to feed? Turns out the microbiome, the bacteria in your intestine, turn out to be super important. You know, when you're pregnant, everyone always says, oh, you're eating for two. Well, actually, you're always eating for 10 trillion. You're eating to feed your gut because those bacteria want to survive. They want to eat. And the question is, what do they eat? Well, they eat what you eat. The question is, how much did you get versus how much did they get? And when you feed those bacteria, they leave you alone. When you starve those bacteria, they eat you. They actually eat the mucin layer right off your intestinal epithelial cells, exposing them and denuding them, and thus contributing to intestinal inflammation, inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, leaky gut, insulin resistance, chronic uh, in, uh, inflammation, and metabolic disease. So you actually have to feed your intestine. Well, what do you feed them? Well, they what they eat. And what do they eat? Fiber. So fiber is what we think, go, you know, goes in the garbage after you smoothie the fruit, right? Turns out the fiber was the food for your bacteria. And we're throwing it in the garbage. That was the important part. I've always said that the juice is nature's way of getting you to uh, uh, eat your fiber. And the reason is because you have to feed your gut. So when you feed the gut fiber, then the fiber is basically the food for the intestine. The bacteria will chew it up and turn those uh, fibers into short chain fatty acids, SCFAs, uh, acetate, propionate, butyrate, valerate. These actually are anti-inflammatory. They're anti-insulin. They're anti-Alzheimer's. They are the way your gut fixes your metabolism. And But they only do it when you feed them because the short chain fatty acids are the breakdown products of those fibers. So you need that. You actually need that. And the point is we're not getting it. Okay. Our fiber consumption should be, should be at 50 grams a day. The USDA says our fiber consumption should be at 25 grams a day because they're trying to be, shall we say, nice to people. Okay. Well, our current fiber consumption is 12 grams a day. So we're at one quarter of what we should be and we're at one half of what the USDA says we should be. So we are fiberless and ultra processed food is fiberless food because you can't freeze fiber. I'll prove it to you. Take an orange, put it in your freezer overnight, take it out the next morning, put it on your kitchen countertop, let it thaw, try to eat it, see what you get. You get mush. Why do you get mush? Because the ice crystals macerate the cell wall, let all the water rush in. Hey, food industry knows that. So what do they do? Squeeze it and freeze it. Now it lasts forever. Now it's frozen concentrated orange juice, right? They've turned a food, which is spoilable, which is potentially contributes to food waste, and they've turned it into a commodity. 
frozen concentrated orange juice, which they can sell on the commodities market because there's no depreciation because that's the definition of commodity, storable food. Mm -hmm. So decreased depreciation, increased profit, lower prices, worse for your health. Basically, the reason we have cheap food is the reason we're all sick. That's the way you have to look at it. You know, another way of saying it is you can pay the farmer or you can pay the doctor. Mm -hmm. Okay. But right now we're paying the doctor and we're paying the doctor way more than it would cost to pay the farmer. That's another way of looking at it. So feed the gut. Number two, protect the liver. Protect the liver from what? Well, protect the liver from toxins. Now, your liver is your detoxification organ, but it has a limit. It can only detoxify so much. Now, there are some toxins that are extremely potent and will kill you at parts per billion, like cyanide or VX gas or, you know, ricin, sarin. Okay. There are other toxins that are not quite as potent, but will still kill you at parts per million. For instance, arsenic or carbon tetrachloride, okay? And then there are toxins that are less toxic that you need a slightly higher dose, like for instance, alcohol or sugar, okay? They're toxins too. They just are toxic at a higher level because we have an innate capacity to be able to metabolize some of it. But right now we are over that limit. And so those are still toxins. So we have to protect our liver from toxins that we can't metabolize. Another example is um, heavy metals. So there's a heavy metal that is pervasive in our food supply. And it's not mercury. You know, everybody talks about the mercury in fish. That's not it. It's cadmium. Cadmium turns out to be very, it, it's, an, uh, it's a, an oxidative stress like no other. And it turns out to be very high in chocolate. But not all chocolate. South American chocolate. So South American cocoa plants really concentrate cadmium. And they're trying to figure out ways to get the cadmium out of the South American chocolate. But that's basically what pretty much all ultra processed chocolate is is south american chocolate because it's cheap okay so that's protect the liver because when your liver is sick you get insulin resistance and that drives all these chronic metabolic diseases and just to add in on the liver i mean all processed foods by nature pretty much i well i shouldn't say that are mostly non-organic so not just the the toxins that you're mentioning but GMOs and glyphosate and all of the other heavy metals and the, and, and the insecticides and the pesticides and the preservatives and everything else. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's away from the sugar. So here you are, you're just packaging it all in that nice little 100 calorie snack pack that you think is healthy for you, right? <laughs> yeah, but it ain't because it's not about calories. It never was. No. Okay. That's what, that's, that's the mistake. People thought it was about calories. It's not about calories. It's about the insulin response. It's about hyperinsulinemia because insulin is the bad guy. People always think of insulin as being the good guy because it lowers your blood glucose. Now, it does lower your blood glucose. That's true. Where does the blood glucose go when it's lowered? It goes into your fat cells mm -hmm. for storage. So the way to think about insulin is not that it's the diabetes hormone. You need to think of it as the energy storage hormone. Insulin shunts energy to fat. Insulin makes fat. More insulin, more fat. Anything that drives up insulin is going to drive up weight gain and also chronic metabolic disease because insulin also causes abnormal growth. So insulin is the driver of cancer. Before we get into the brain, can you explain how fructose versus glucose relate to insulin and the response and fatty liver? Sure. So sugar, dietary sugar, sucrose, you know, the stuff you put in your coffee, the crystals, right? Sucrose 
is two molecules in one. Glucose, fructose. They are not the same. Glucose is not that sweet. Glucose is eh. Okay. Glucose is like Cairo syrup. You don't people see go you don't see people going around chugging Cairo syrup, do you? Mm -hmm. Okay. We're not all that interested in glucose, really. Okay, yes, it's an energy substrate. Yes, every cell on the planet can burn glucose for energy. But it's not all that enticing. It's all right in a molasses cookie, but, you know, that's about it. All right? Glucose is, yeah. All right? Now, fructose, on the other hand, that's the molecule that is sweet. That's the molecule we seek. That's the molecule that activates the reward center. That's the molecule that's addictive. And it turns out that fructose is metabolized completely differently from that of glucose. Glucose in the liver goes to glycogen, liver starch. And liver starch is non-toxic. That's what your liver wants to do with excess energy, is turn it into glycogen. That's why marathoners carb load before a race, is to build up their glycogen stores. Turns out fructose does not go to glycogen. And fructose is not metabolized in any other organ other than the liver. So when you consume a fructose load, you're consuming, you know, it's going straight to the liver and it's not going to glycogen. It's going straight down to your mitochondria. It's overwhelming your mitochondria and your mitochondria become so overwhelmed that they can't process all that substrate. And so they turn it into fat in an effort to try to export it out of the liver. So it will go to the adipose tissue and leave the liver alone. Mm -hmm. now, Sometimes it does that effectively, in which case you end up with high triglycerides in the blood, and high triglycerides can lead to heart, heart disease and obesity. But sometimes the fat in the liver doesn't make it out. Sometimes it precipitates in the liver. Now you've got a lipid droplet. Now you've got non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And what that does is that mucks up the works in terms of signaling. And so that, that creates this thing called insulin resistance. And insulin resistance means your pancreas has to work harder to make the liver do its job. And when that happens, that raises insulin levels all over the body. And so that's what's driving energy into fat at that point. So glucose goes to glycogen. Yes, glucose stimulates an insulin release. That's true, but the insulin then comes down. Fructose stimulates insulin resistance, and the insulin does not come down. So even though glucose is not great, it's a walk in the park compared to fructose. And sugar is both. And the glucose is actually giving you stored energy to burn for athlete, athletics or, or that sort of thing, where the <laughs> fructose is not. So I don't know how old you are, Sarah. But 47. Okay. You're not old enough to remember the original Gatorade. I drank a lot of Gatorade. It, it could have been the original. I, I had my soccer games. Okay. Well, if you're 47, you probably were not drinking the, the original. You're probably drinking what happened after Pepsi bought Gatorade. Pepsi bought Gatorade in 1992. When were you playing soccer? Mm, 86, 86. 86? Yeah. Well, then maybe you did. I don't know. Anyway. Once upon a time, there was this thing called Gatorade. <laughs> In 1965, Dr. Robert Cade invented this concoction that he saw caused uh, uh, sodium and water absorption across the brush border of the intestine to increase plasma volume and to be able to replete glycogen. It was a combination of sodium, glucose, and water. The same thing we give cholera victims in India today, an oral rehydration solution. I mean, because he was at the University of Florida, he called it Gatorade, and he patented it. And in 1972, the Florida Gators won the Sugar Bowl against the Auburn Tigers, and Gatorade made a big splash. So that original Gatorade had glucose, sodium, and water. That's it. It tasted like tiger piss. It tasted awful, okay? And I remember it. And I remember saying, thinking to myself, 
Who in their right mind would drink this crap? Well, not that many people, apparently. <laughs> Stokely's made Gatorade. They, that was who the um, University of Florida licensed it to originally. Well, in 1992, Pepsi bought Gatorade. And they said, how are we going to market this? And they did two things. Michael Jordan and high fructose corn syrup. So Gatorade never had fructose in it before 1992. But they added high fructose corn syrup to it to make it sweet. Now, was that fructose necessary for Gatorade to work? No. Why did they add it? To make sure people were going to buy it and drink it. There you go. Absolutely. There you go. So glucose was in Gatorade before fructose was. And the question is, does it need to be? And the answer is, no, it doesn't need to be. But it is, because that's what sells. You know what's so amazing, Rob, is that my daughter is an athlete at USC uh, on the rowing team. And you go into this amazing athletic facility, amazing, professional. You would think that you were going into the New York Giants facility. And in their refrigerator is all, all the snacks and the, and the protein foods for them and the, the energy drinks. And there's Gatorade and things that are even worse. And then the protein snacks are these little package like peanut butter cracker sections that, that you would give your, your kindergartner for, for their lunch. Right. And I'm thinking that's why this message is so important because you at the, even at the highest level, people don't understand the processed food is not real food and what it's doing to the liver, the brain, and the gut, the three things that really are our lives, right? Um, we haven't even gotten to the brain yet. <laughs> no, we haven't. And But before we get there, I want to just touch on, because we touched on fructose and glucose, artificial sweeteners, because everyone thinks, okay, so I can eat these. And I'll just tell you my own personal story. I was addicted to Splenda. And then I was told, okay, get rid of the Splenda, go to the Stevia. And Stevia is a good choice. But for people that are addicted to sugar and sweet, when you eat too much Stevia, it can even back up the liver. So all artificial sweeteners can cause issues. But let's talk about those and their relationship to processed foods. So everyone thinks artificial sweeteners are the answer to fructose. Because number one, no calories. Number two, no fructose. And if that's all that was going on, that would seem right. But that's not all that's going on. There's way more than that. The epidemiologic evidence, and I just looked it up earlier today. It was in uh, JAMA Internal Medicine 2019. Uh, first uh, author is Hurley, H-U-R-L-E-E. -E. Um, or Hunley, Hunley, H-U-N-L-E-E, -E, sorry. Um, the toxicity of one Coca-Cola equals the toxicity of two diet Coca-Colas. Half as bad. Now, half as bad does not mean good. Half as bad means half as bad. Okay? Does not mean good. Now, the question is, if there's no calories and there's no fructose, why is it bad at all? And the answer is because there are other things going on. Number one, you put something sweet on the tongue. Message goes tongue to brain, sugar's coming. Message goes brain to pancreas, sugar's coming, release the insulin. But the sugar never comes because it was a diet sweetener. Turns out the pancreas still releases the insulin. We now know that. We didn't used to, but now we actually know that. And so that's driving energy into fat anyway. Remember, insulin's the energy storage hormone. So anything that tells your brain that sweet's coming is going to end up driving adiposity through this vagus nerve, the connection between the brain and the pancreas. And the artificial sweeteners do not fix that problem. They actually accentuate that problem. So that's problem number one. Problem number two, work from the Weizmann Institute in Rehovot, Israel, from Elenov's lab, have shown that 
most of the artificial sweeteners, not all of them, but most of them, actually change the microbiome, alter the microbiome, and in the process generate this phenomenon called leaky gut, changing uh, gut permeability and allowing for cytokines and whole bacteria to actually make it across the intestine into the bloodstream, generating systemic inflammation and glucose intolerance. Well, if you generate glucose intolerance, you're gonna end up generating higher insulin as well. And then there's even a third line of uh, reasoning based on some in vitro studies, which show that adipose tissue has receptors for some of the diet sweeteners. Now, why? I have no idea. What, what's the teleologic reason for that? I couldn't begin to tell you, but, you know, there it is. So the bottom line is artificial sweeteners are not the panacea that the food industry would have you believe. Yeah. So really what we need to do is de-sweeten our lives, not substitute. Yeah. And, you know, I've gone through that, that because I'm a pretty, I'm a type A personality, very black and white. So I had to cut all sweetener, cold, you know, cold turkey. And it's amazing your taste buds come back. You just have yeah. three weeks of taking yeah. out that sweetness and then you can actually taste a piece of fruit and yeah. the sweetness in it. And so this gets us actually leads us into the brain and the addiction because you know, you do cocaine or alcohol, you have one pathway of addiction where right. sugar, there's three separate pathways. And that's why we are all addicted to <laughs> sugar and we all have to eat every single day. That is why it's such a hard um, addiction to be, to get over. Well, so it's, it's, it's particularly hard because the substrate never goes away because every ultra processed food is spiked with it on purpose. 74% of the items in the American grocery store are spiked with added sugar, not because the uh, public wants it, but because the food industry wants it to be there to keep you consuming. Right. How, do you, how easy do you think it would be to get off heroin if there was heroin in all the food? I had this conversation with someone today who's struggling with their relationship with food. And I'm sitting here going, you are one of the 90% of the Americans that are struggling with their relationship with food because processed food has hijacked our relationship with food. You right. know, we, we, we have this, we constantly are thinking about it, but it's because of the sweeteners of the fructose and the, the hyper palatability where you're combining the seed oils, the fats, the salt, and the sugar and the sweeteners all together. And it's literally like a bomb's gone off in our mouth versus right. eating a sweet potato. Or so, the, so the question is, what's specifically addictive? We've gone, you know, we, we've done this analysis. So fast food is really four things. Okay, it's four things. It is um, uh, uh, sugar, caffeine, fat, and salt. All right. So let's take salt. Is salt addictive? No, it is habituating, but it's not addictive. You can put somebody on a DASH diet, reduce their salt consumption, and in two, three months, their receptors for salt receptors on their tongue will go back to normal and they won't crave it. Okay, so you can modulate it. Number two, is fat addictive? Turns out, Fat increases the salience for sugar, but it doesn't actually cause addiction. And you can actually look at the neuroimaging in the brain. It changes the, set, the somatosensory cortex activity. It does not change the limbic system or the nucleus accumbens, the reward center activity. So fat can increase the salience of sugar like a Cinnabon, but it is in and of itself, it is not addictive. If it were addictive, then all then the Atkins diet wouldn't work, would it? Okay. Now, caffeine. Caffeine is a model of addiction. Okay, that's the you know the easiest thing to say is addictive. You got tolerance, you got withdrawal, you know, uh, you know, the difference is it's not dangerous. If it were dangerous, it would be regulated. But, you know, there's a Starbucks on every street corner because it's not dangerous, but it's addictive. 
And finally, sugar. So the question is, is sugar addictive? And the answer is yes, we have the data to demonstrate both from a, a demographic, from an epidemiologic, from a physiologic, and also from a neuroimaging standpoint that in fact, sugar is addictive. Now, having said that, ultra processed food is addictive, but the WHO has not yet classified it as such. We are working on that. That is in process. And I'm actually the keynote speaker at the International Food Addiction Conference in London in May of next year to discuss exactly this. So it's in process. We're not there yet. Amazing. Okay. So uh, apart from the addiction, talk about, we only, I can't believe how quickly this has already gone, um, how sugar impacts the brain. Well, so sugar impacts the brain in multiple ways. Remember, the brain runs on mitochondria and mitochondria run on glucose. So glucose is the energy substrate for the brain. Now, the brain can also run on ketones. One of the reasons why the ketogenic diet is potentially a treatment for multiple brain disorders. And if you read Dr. Christopher Palmer's book, Brain Energy, Okay, and I highly, highly, highly recommend it. It is a phenomenal read. It basically explains that pretty much all mental health issues come down to metabolic processes. And mitochondria are not in the brain are not working right. Well, guess what's making them not work right? Sugar and alcohol. Not surprising. They don't, it makes your liver mitochondria not work right. Why should your brain mitochondria be any different? It's the same thing. So you got to basically protect your brain, support your brain by getting rid of the substrates that are inhibiting mitochondrial function, <clears throat> sugar and alcohol. In addition, you also need to improve neurotransmission and brain structure. And that's what omega-3s do. So omega-3s are necessary for neurotransmission, EPA, eicosapentaenoic acid. That's the thing that gives fish its fishy smell, by the way. And DHA, docohexaenoic acid. That is relatively neutral in terms of smell. Um, the problem is the only place you can get both is marine life. And so the vegans are not getting both. Can you use algal oil to supplement? And the answer is it will supplement DHA. It won't supplement the EPA. So it's a little complicated, but the bottom line is you need those for neurotransmission. And it's been shown that omega-3 deficiency leads to depression and other mental health disorders. In addition, there are other compounds that are necessary for normal brain function like zinc and selenium. So not heavy metals, but metals. And those are in short supply in ultra processed food as well. Right. So pretty much protect the liver, get rid of the sugar, feed the gut fiber, support the brain, omega-3s, and these um, brain active substances. I love that's it. Called, that's called real food. Right. Um, before we go, I wanted to mention one supplement. There's a couple, but one that gets people off of that addiction and that roller coaster and it's the accelerated keto and why this kicks you into ketosis within 30 minutes and then your body your increased atp goes up five to ten times teaches your body to look for fat stores instead of using outside food for energy but then what it's doing is it's getting it's breaking that um connection and that that craving for the sugar it also has ingredients in there to detox the liver on a daily basis and turn that saturated fat into unsaturated fat. And it's enhanced with scalar frequencies like all of the products to cleanse the liver, convert that saturated fat into unsaturated fat and increase the metabolic rate. You don't have to be on a high ketogenic diet or high fat diet. You just use it to intermittent fast, lower your insulin resistance, and then make the smart food choices, which Rob, what is the answer? What do you tell people to focus on or how to get out of this processed food cycle that everyone's in? 
Yeah, it's a problem. Uh, I'll tell you where it's the biggest problem. What is the biggest fast food franchise in the world? McDonald's. Nope. Try again. Hmm. Now I'm on the spot. Um... Biggest fast food franchise in the world. Our nation's public schools. Oh, yes, of course. That's okay. not even food. It had, there are more public schools than there are Subways and McDonald's and Wendy's and Jack in the Box and, you know, Popeye's and everything put together. Okay. That is the largest fast food franchise in the world. And our kids are eating crap because they're eating ultra processed food. The question is, why are they eating ultra processed food? The answer is because the schools don't have any place to prepare real food. They used to but they've been taken out by the school because the ultra processed food companies told them they could. And so they turned all the food preparation facilities into classrooms back in the 1980s. Well, that was their plan all along because now all the schools are hostage to the food industry. Now they have to get their food from ultra processed food concerns. Well, we have figured out how to fix that. So I am the chief science officer and co-founder of a nonprofit called Eat Real. You can find it online, eatreal.org. And we have developed a new business model whereby the food services director for a school district can purchase or rent a dilapidated factory and repurpose it to become a food preparation facility for the entire district. And the food preparation people are all in one place, so they're centralized, so it decreases costs. They can buy a scale because they're basically making 27,000 meals a day, so they can buy cheaper and local, and they can control what's in it. And then they farm it out by truck to each school, so every kid gets a hot, home-cooked meal every single day, mm. and the school district saves money. Amazing. And, you know, our kids are sitting ducks. They are not in control of their food. They're, they're given, and especially the lower class, um, you know, it's a definitely a socioeconomic situation as well, which is so unfortunate. So thank well, you for that work. We can, fix, we can fix that. Just yeah. remember, the National School Breakfast Program breakfast is a bowl of Fruit Loops and a glass of orange juice. That is 41 grams of sugar, and it's just breakfast. The American Heart Association says that for children, the upper limit should be 12 grams for the entire day. So they are over triple their dose and it's just breakfast. And you That's wonder that. why all these kids have anxiety and depression, ADHD um, and obesity and fatty liver, things that are not supposed to be in children. My goodness, right. we didn't even have a chance to get into your perfect, which I'm so, you know, I actually thought about this um, idea before I heard you talk about it. So give well, let's, let's do it real quick. So it's called perfect, P-E-R-F-A-C-T dot co. Everyone can go online, perfect dot co. And what it does is it accesses your grocery store and applies filters that you control to basically Take away all the things in the store you don't want to see. So it only offers you the items in your grocery store, in your grocery store, that are healthy for you. I love it. According to your autoimmune issues or your disease, whatever it is, I love it, love it, love pick it. Your, pick your disease process or pick your cultural uh, 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 philosophy. You can go vegan. You can go gluten-free. You can you know, pick your allergy that you want to avoid. It will only provide you with those foods that fit your biochemical or and cultural profile. Rob, you're amazing. All of your work and your books. Everyone, please go out and get Metabolical. I love the name, first of all, but an amazing book and your other books as well. And you're just a wealth of knowledge in doing all of this amazing work. So bless you. For That's my job.
And um, we're going to have you back on because there's so much more we, we need to get into. So thanks, Rob. And thank you, everyone else, for joining us today. If I can help you with your health issues, if you have questions about what we talked about today, contact me directly through my website, sarabandhealth.com. Happy to put together a protocol for you and join the free group coaching on Telegram with the link below. I teach you on a daily basis with tips and tools to enhance your health. And you will be a part of an amazing like-minded group to support you on your journey so that you can take control of your health for the first time. You can follow me on Facebook and Instagram under Accelerated Health Products across over 100 channels under Accelerated Health TV and Radio Show. And my goal is to reach everyone on earth with eyes to see and ears to hear my message of healing. So help me with that goal. Share this with a few of your friends or family members who may need my help. Most people today are walking around undiagnosed with insulin resistance or pre-diabetes. So they definitely need to hear this. You can join us every week, Mondays at 2 p.m. Pacific, Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Pacific, and you can use coupon WELCOME10 for 10% off site-wide at therabantahealth.com. Thanks again for joining us here and have a great week.